So this session is governance, law, and climate change. And uh, you know the broader areas of challenge, I know a lot of us have been waiting for this session. We have totally four speakers for this session. Hello from Canada. I'm Dr. David Boyd, the United Nations Special Rapporteur on Human Rights and the Environment. Delighted to be joining you for this important conference, and uh, I really wish I could be there in person. I've always wanted to visit Bhutan. Ladies and gentlemen, the latest reports from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change confirm that we are living in a climate emergency. This is proof beyond a reasonable doubt. The IPCC report on physical climate science described the unexpectedly rapid intensification of impacts, including extreme weather events, such as the horrific floods we've seen in Pakistan, the wildfires in Australia, and really impacts all over the globe. The UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, said this is code red for humanity. A few months later, the IPC published a report on adaptation, outlining 127 key risks to human health and well-being. Secretary General Guterres described this report as an atlas of human suffering. On Canada's west coast where I live, in the summer of 2021, temperatures spiked during a heat dome to more than 50 degrees Celsius. 50 degrees in Canada. More than 600 people died, mainly older persons and people living in poverty. Two months later, we experienced an atmospheric river that dumped unprecedented volumes of rain, destroying infrastructure at a cost of many billions of dollars. The global climate crisis is also a human rights crisis. The rights to life, health, food, water, cultural rights, the rights of the child, and of course the right to a healthy environment are all being jeopardized and violated on a daily basis. And the adverse impacts fall disproportionately upon the shoulders of poor, vulnerable, and marginalized populations. In my role as the UN Special Rapporteur, I have witnessed the devastation caused by the climate crisis. I visited Vuni Dongaloa, a village in Fiji that had to be completely relocated because of rising sea levels, storm surges, and saltwater contamination of their drinking water and agricultural lands. I met other Fijians who lost their homes during tropical cyclones. They were living in very rough conditions in informal settlements, suffering from typhoid fever outbreaks, again, because of flooding exacerbated by climate change. I've met pastoralists in Kenya whose livestock starved to death because of drought, pushing people into extreme poverty. I met indigenous Sami people from Northern Norway whose traditional culture based on reindeer herding is jeopardized by warm and erratic winter weather. It's clear that the people of Fiji, Kenya, other climate vulnerable nations and indigenous peoples have almost zero responsibility for in causing the climate crisis. And yet they are bearing the costs of losing their homes, losing their livelihoods, relocating and rebuilding their communities. It is G20 nations that cause almost 80% of greenhouse gas emissions today and an even higher proportion historically. The G20 must lead the way in cutting emissions and in paying for both adaptation and loss and damage. In addition to the terrible COVID pandemic that continues, we face a second pandemic whose effects, if you can imagine it, may be even more devastating in the long term. I'm referring to the massive increase in mental health problems, particularly afflicting young people. An article published in The Lancet, a highly respected medical journal, surveyed 10,000 young people from across the world and their attitudes related to the climate crisis. The survey found that 77% are frightened of the future, 56% believe that humanity is doomed, and 40% do not want to bring children into the dystopian world they envision. Three decades ago, governments negotiated the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, pledging to prevent dangerous anthropogenic interference with the Earth's climate system. 27 years later, 27 COPs later, this commitment has not been met. The burning of coal, natural gas, and oil have all skyrocketed. Since 1990, in just 30 years, 
humans have produced as much carbon dioxide as in the previous 240 years since the dawn of the Industrial Revolution. Global greenhouse gas emissions have jumped more than 65% since 1992. And hum humanity is nowhere near achieving the promise of the Paris Agreement to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. In fact, we're in danger of breaching that in the next few years. The Achilles heel of international environmental law, including the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, is a complete lack of effective compliance and enforcement mechanisms, resulting in a lack of accountability. Yet we live in a world where the leading scientists are calling for rapid, systemic, and transformative change. And here's where my talk turns to being more optimistic. Human rights have a potentially powerful role to play in addressing the climate crisis and indeed the triple planetary crisis. We know from the events of recent centuries that human rights can be a catalyst for transformative changes in society. The abolitionists invoked freedom and equality in successfully ending slavery. Women, the civil rights movement, the anti-apartheid movement and indigenous peoples have all used human rights to catalyze societal transformations. Now, of course, Human rights are not an easy, instant, or omnipotent solution, but history proves they can be powerful game changers. And in that vein, I'm delighted to report that in October of 2021, the United Nations Human Rights Council adopted a resolution recognizing for the first time at the global level that everyone everywhere has the right to live in a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment. The UN General Assembly adopted a similar resolution in July of 2022. They're not legally binding, but these resolutions will be a catalyst for more ambitious action at the national level. We can look back at the 2010 UN resolutions on the right to water to see what kind of impacts these resolutions have. A number of countries, including Costa Rica, Fiji, Mexico, Slovenia and Tunisia added the right to water to their constitutions their highest and strongest laws. Other nations from Colombia to France changed their legislation. And most importantly, nations have accelerated efforts to fulfill the rights to water and sanitation. Mexico extended clean drinking water to more than 1,000 rural communities in the past decade. Slovenia has prioritized drinking water for Roma communities living in informal settlements. And here in my home, Canada, Safe drinking water infrastructure has been built in partnership with more than 130 indigenous communities that had suffered without clean water for decades. When we turn to human rights and climate change, we see the beginnings of positive and very promising changes. Powerful new environmental uh, climate legislation with a human rights focus in the Philippines, Mexico, and Fiji. An an inspiring fusion of human rights experts and climate change experts who developed Uruguay's climate action plan. And I note that Uruguay has gone from being primarily dependent on imported fossil fuels for generating all of their electricity to almost exclusively dependent on domestic renewable energy in the course of less than a decade. A growing number of states are incorporating human rights into their nationally determined contributions under the Paris Agreement, including leading nations where human rights are at the heart of their plans, such as Costa Rica, the Maldives, and the Marshall Islands. I note that Costa Rica already generates 99% of its electricity from renewables, including solar, wind, and geothermal, and Costa Rica prohibits oil and gas development. More than 40 nations have joined the Powering Past Coal Coalition pledging to end all coal use for electricity by 2030. At least 10 states already generate more than 95% and in some cases 100% of their electricity from renewables, including Albania, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Costa Rica, Iceland, Namibia, Norway, Paraguay, Tajikistan, Uruguay, and Zambia. In a growing number of countries, courts have used human rights to hold governments and businesses accountable for taking much more ambitious climate action. In the Netherlands, the famous Urgenda decision, in Germany, the Neubauer decision, in Colombia, the Future Generations case, and more. 
In recent months, courts in Argentina and South Africa struck down offshore oil and gas exploration permits because they were inconsistent with the constitutional right to live in a healthy environment because of adverse impacts on whales, marine mammals, and small-scale fishing communities. The giant fossil fuel corporation Shell has been held responsible for climate-related human rights abuses in a Dutch court. And in this past September, in a groundbreaking decision, the UN Human Rights Committee determined that Australia had violated the rights of Indigenous people living on the Torres Strait Islands by failing to take adequate adaptation action to protect them against the impacts of the climate crisis. Ladies and gentlemen, the bottom line is this. Human rights must be at the heart of all climate action, mitigation to reduce emissions and protect forests, adaptation to prepare for the inevitable impacts, and addressing loss and damage to compensate those in climate vulnerable nations who are suffering so greatly. These, this approach, a human rights-based approach to climate action, must be recognized as an obligation, not an option. We must all seize the moment and use our right to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment as a battering ram to knock down the walls of resistance that are holding us back from making the rapid, systemic, and transformative changes necessary to address the climate crisis and accelerate progress towards achieving the 2030 UN Sustainable Development Goals. The time for talk is over. It's time for action. Thank you for listening, and I hope that you have an excellent conference, and I also hope that we can work together in the months and years ahead.